So I'll ask again, how are your brains today? Your brains are awesome. That's great. They could be better. Just saying. So um, we're going to talk about brain mapping, something called QEEG, and also neurofeedback, which is a form of biofeedback on the brain. Um, when thinking about how your brain functions or how anything functions in your mind or your brain, there's a tendency to pathologize, to say, oh, this is broken, or to come at the problem as if you're trying to identify the, the pathologies. And to a large extent, we tend to focus on uh, diagnostic labels, going after what the actual bucket is that our problem fits into. And I find that less useful, especially in a biohacking context or a peak performance context, to think about what's wrong with you. It's more like, oh, where are the bottlenecks in resources? Even the most highly performant of us will have days wherein our afternoons are burnt out. We don't sleep as well. We aren't as creative, aren't as flexible. When we fly across the ocean or sleep deprived, things like that. So um, let's get into some of the tech, and I'll give you a little bit of a historical background and then talk about or show you some of the actual things we find in brains and how we would go about making a permanent change over time. So first of all, what is this stuff, EEG? Largely, it's brain waves. So you have uh, sulci and gyri, little squiggles in your cortex that increase the surface area. And all of the cells that are in columns at right angles to your skull can be picked up from outside the scalp. And no, you don't need to have a bald head to get an EEG. Uh, actually, those of us with bald heads produce really kind of crappy EEGs. It's hard to get good signals when you don't have hair protecting the scalp and keeping it soft, as my technician Johannes is discovering right now, recording somebody upstairs. So EEG is several things, ongoing EEG, millions, trillions, billions of things happening in your brain all the time. You can also look at EEG from sort of a research perspective. And you would do that by looking at what's called ERPs, little evoked events in the brain that are responding to usually attention resources. Uh, and then we talk about something called quantitative EEG, which is just an EEG recording baseline. But then you take it and compare it to a normative database of several thousand people and basically see how weird you are compared to everyone else who's your age. And once you know where the, the unusual parts of your brain are, then the fun begins. Then you say, oh, this pattern often means, at a population level, X, Y, or Z. And then you try to figure out if this is a relevant bottleneck for you or a performance goal for you. So after you determine what the patterns are, then you would change the brain using neurofeedback or central biofeedback. So again, EEG versus quantitative EEG. Quantitative really refers to the analysis, not the recording. And it's this database comparison. A couple things to say about that. One is these databases are incredibly robust. And also, you don't change relative to other people all that much, year after year after year. A brain map on you today and in a year would be identical, assuming you didn't do something to your brain that was significant, like develop a really serious meditation practice, do neurofeedback, have a head injury, something else to really change your brain. Uh, again, getting away from this idea of diagnostic labels the brain map comes up with, because we compare you to a population, it, com it comes up with patterns that are sort of valid at a population level, but may not be valid for you. So again, not diagnostic, not top-down, more of a hypothesis generator or a prognostic test. And so we will look at several things and try to figure out where the statistically unusual events are in your brain, and then figure out if they mean something for you that is worth going after. Here's some examples. The amplitude of, your, of different brain waves or connectivity of regions can show you things like how thick your skull is, if you have brain injuries, if you're asleep, et cetera. Uh, the theta-beta ratio is among the most highly validated discriminant markers for things like executive function. Uh, a single measure of the ratio of theta to beta brain waves at the vertex of your head can sort blindly ADHD and non-ADHD brains with, I think, 94% specificity. Huge for, in terms of picking out certain things. Uh, peak alpha frequency. I can actually tell you if you're slower in your cognitive speed than other people your age. And if it slows down a certain percentage, I can tell if you're having troubles accessing memory or finding words. That's a speed of processing thing, not a memory thing, by the way. So uh, let's back up a little bit because the field of QEG sort of followed the field of neurofeedback. And EEG broadly is a sleep science historically. And so a lot of the language we use, the technology we use is sort of couched in sleep research terms. Before we were doing QEGs, though, we were doing regular old EEGs. There's an EEG scientist named Barry Sturman. He was at UCLA in the late 60s. And NASA went to Sturman and said, look, our astronauts are getting sick, breathing in 
rocket fuel vapors, methyl hydrazine. Please figure out how dangerous this stuff is. And so Sturman took a, this is in the late 60s, so animal research isn't quite done this way now. So I'm going to tell you this story, you know, uh, hold your groans. But Dr. Sturman took a plexiglass airtight cage, put a beaker of rocket fuel in it, put a cat in the cage, closed the door, and started a timer. And he found that um, of the 30 cats or so, most of them had a really perfect dose-dependent curve where increased minutes in the cage meant increased symptoms. So rocket fuel makes you have seizures, essentially, over time. And uh, here's the data. So the bottom solid line is the measurement of about 24 cats. And this is actually a, an adjusted slide. It used to say vomiting, vocalizing, panting, seizure, coma, death. But they removed coma and death from the paper for some reason. Uh, 24 out of 30 cats, perfect dose-dependent curve. The other cats required two and a half times as much exposure to show any instability, drooling, stumbling, and were really seizure-resistant. And he couldn't figure out why until he rem remembered that six months prior, he'd done another experiment, uh, seeing if he could get cats to raise a brainwave in response to a little chicken broth dropped into their mouth. And they could, a little operant conditioning. So you can think Skinner's pigeons shape a behavior that already exists. And that was wonderful. He put them back in the subject pool, and months later, these cats had seizure-resistant brains and refused to have seizures. Turns out that Dr. Sturman's lab manager was an epileptic, uh, uncontrolled uh, epileptic. Um, I'll show you her data in a minute, I think. But over time, uh, the research assistant had her seizures controlled. Several other single case studies were successful. And then over time, um, Sturman produced a paper in 2000 that showed 82% of subjects showed a more than 30% drop in seizures, and 5% of people had complete reduction or control of seizures for over a year. I typically see 95% sort of abolishment of seizures when I work with them. Usually in about three or four months, they're just kind of gone and gone for good or dramatically reduced over time. Um, this is his lab manager's data, and these are tens of seizures on this scale. So when he first started tracking her, she was tracking her seizures in 1970, she was having 30, 40, 50 seizures a month. And if you know anything about epilepsy, that's an awful lot of tonic-clonic grand mal seizures that will kill you over time. And she was on Meberol, Tegretol, Dilantin, huge neuroleptics that were not controlling her seizures. So she basically demanded he build her a machine to do what they just did for the cats. And he built her machine, they played around with it, and off uh, over several years, she trained, and then she went off all of her meds right here, and she remained seizure-free where the blue line is for over a year. Complete cessation of seizures after having dozens a month for many, many years. So that was a pretty impressive thing. And from there, the, the, the neurofeedback work spread out from epilepsy. And again, because EEG is a sleep domain initially, we have lots of awareness of sleep if you're an EEG researcher, and discovered that the same techniques that can ameliorate seizures also improve sleep architecture, sleep onset, sleep maintenance, sleep cessation, reliably, really reliably. Uh, and then from there, we moved into all these other domains. At this point, the low-hanging fruit for neurofeedback are things like sleep, anxiety, and ADHD. Something like 90, 95% of people can eliminate ADHD for good in three or four months of training, 40 sessions or so, can usually eliminate ADHD for permanently over time. So it's a change, it's happened slowly, but once it's happened, your brain has new resources and it tends to reinforce those resources and practice them just by living in your brain. So why does it work? Mostly because the brain is already changing all the time. It's not a question of if you're going to get change, it's more like how would you like to control the change you're going to get, right? So I'm sure most of you folks who are very savvy know that the brain tends to rewire itself. So neurons that are touching, that have a synapse between them, get used to firing together when they fire in a chain over time. So if you practice different firing patterns, your brain actually changes over time. In fact, if I took one of you guys and sent you to piano lesson today, assuming you don't already play piano, by the end of today, every single hand cell would have moved around and talked to a different cell in the motor cortex of your brain. Every single cell. So learning, moving cells around, rewiring happens on the order of minutes, and then making new cells and building circuits out of novel cells takes about five weeks. So you have a five-minute to five-week sort of time scale of change in the brain. And many things support this, but learning uh, is a process of change. Uh, is this a question of your mind improving or your brain improving? Um, not really a valid question. 
from, at least from my perspective. I'm a cognitive neuroscientist, so for me, it's all about how the brain produces the human experience and resources of executive function, sleep, stress, mood, substance abuse, et cetera. So I'm really thinking about the intersection of the tissue and the things the tissue is producing. And from my perspective, the mind is simply the part of the brain you're aware of, hopefully. And there's lots of things you aren't aware of. The vast majority of what your brain is doing, you're not aware of at all. It's just things happening. Like you aren't really aware of your, you know, peristalsis motion in your gut moving. Some of you probably are, but most of us aren't that aware of the deep internal things. Um, some things in the brain are primarily neurological, physiological. You're not going to talk therapy your way out of ADHD ever. You might develop scaffolding, behavioral tricks to minimize the impact on your life, but you're never going to get rid of the sort of novelty-seeking, high-stimulus ADHD type of brain by doing talk therapy. And other things as well, you would never talk therapy your way out of. But some things you can. So anxiety often responds well to talk therapy. Or trauma responds pretty well. But anxiety and trauma end up being a psychological, if you will, pattern that then produces physiological change. So if the brain has learned to do it, is it physiological or is it psychological? Again, I don't think that division's all that meaningful, ultimately. All right, so quantitative EEG. How do we figure out what is going on inside your noggin? First of all, we'll put a full head cap on your head. Um, we will then measure about 21 locations. Um, that number comes from the sleep research. Old classic data, you put 19 channels plus ear clips on the ears, and this is why a 21-channel cap is the standard in the field. Um, a big part of quantitative EEG is the database of comparison. You know, who are you comparing yourself to? And because of sleep research, the vast majority of reference population databases are 19-channel databases. So while we could get more information off the scalp, in fact, if you go to 70 electrodes in the scalp, the spatial precision of EEG is equivalent of that of fMRI. So you can do huge things with EEG, but from a clinical perspective, that's kind of like overkill. And we mostly look at the 19 channels in the scalp and compare them to uh, the reference database. The EEG is very stable day-to-day, year-to-year, uh, maturation is the biggest change. So we reference your data to other people your age or to a mathematical sort of average brain at your age, uh, a regression line through the database on age and then plot you on that line, essentially. If you're interested in knowing more about quantitative EEG, my mentor in this field, Jack Johnstone, who died a couple years ago, wrote a great paper in 2005 talking about the state of the databases, the five or six commercial products, how big they are, what their strengths and weaknesses are. And Jack talks a lot about this idea of endophenotypes, uh, which actually are kind of like biomarkers, right? Jack published this paper before the word biomarker was all that in you know, common use. So the idea is that um, there's these subcomponents that aren't necessarily diagnostic labels or high-level things you can talk about in psychology, but that might be patterns that show up across people that will represent resource differences within you that can lead to either performance improvements or symptoms, and we care about those resources, not the label above them, so to speak. So again, I mentioned some discriminants earlier. Here are some most reliable. Here are the ones that we tend to look at in the brain when I look at your brain. And for about a dozen of you, uh, we'll go over this in the next couple of days, and then I'll probably go over it again with you next week on the phone or something. But again, theta-beta ratio. Theta-beta ratio is a huge marker for executive function. In uh, non-elders, it's incredibly reliable for screening for ADHD. In uh, elders, it actually can predict progression to dementia or not if you have mild memory issues. And I'll show you some data on that in a minute. We also look at eyes open slow frequencies. Most of us make a lot of slow frequencies when we close our eyes. The visual system goes into alpha in the back of the head. That's supposed to happen. When you open your eyes, that alpha is suppressed, replaced with beta, faster frequency. Well, if you open your eyes and your visual system is stuck in alpha, we would call that inattention. If that's very bad, we'd call that ADD. If you make a lot of theta in the dopamine-driven sort of frontal cortex with your eyes open, we would call that ADHD. Um, again, my goal is not to get to the diagnostic label, so I'm not going to say, oh, you have ADHD. I might go, oh, high theta state, so you're pretty impulsive, you're pattern matching, you're novelty seeking. Does that work for you? Does it get in your way? And how you answer that question tells us how aggressively you go after different resources. So again, we're not trying to make you normal or average. We're trying to figure out where the bottlenecks are for your particular performance limits and goals, 
and then ease those through neurofeedback. Uh, other things that show up, I mentioned alpha speed as a, process, as a function of processing speed. Alpha speeds up until about age 25 as your brain myelinates the neurons, wraps the neurons in insulation, and it slows down about 60 and older as you lose enough cell bodies to have a decreased speed of firing. When you're more than a standard deviation slower than other people your age, your speed of processing is slow enough, you can't grab things out of your memory or word finding becomes a real hard time, a hard problem for some people. Other things that show up, uh, we look at connectivity patterns. When you receive wear and tear, when you bang your head, don't do that. When you bang your head, connectivity changes. You break tracks, you get subtle inflammation, and that shows up really reliably typically. Uh, we usually use databases of comparison for specific populations as well. So if you have a lot of injuries, we we'll compare you to an injured population and see if it seems plausible that you're experiencing symptoms from an injury versus symptoms from being sleep deprived or something. Uh, let's see what else. Oh, we also tend to look for certain, we call this hot spotology, where you look for certain cortical patterns and say, oh, the scalp is hot in this frequency above a cortex involved with X resource, therefore maybe that's showing up as a dysregulated resource. So a little hot spot of beta in the front midline is OCD. On the back midline is PTSD. Um, if I see beta in the middle, usually it's an over-arousal, sleep, pain, kind of a problem settling down. I'll show you some of these uh, data sets in a moment. But essentially, there's several papers showing that these subtyping, the phenomenological sort of assessment, if you will, of these patterns is valid and reliable as long as you don't try to make everything reliable for every individual person. So at a population level, these patterns are pretty reliable. Also, it turns out that the, the changes in the mapping can tell you if medications are working. Uh, one of my dissertation committee chairs, Dr. Andy Luchter, find that within a week after starting an antidepressant, you can tell if it's going to work a month later. Because antidepressants take about three to five weeks to really work for most people. The average person needs to go on three or four different antidepressants before you find one that really works. Well, Dr. Luchter can assess your brain, and after, um, initially it was 48 hours, now he's cautious and says a week. You can see the changes in the brain that tell you, aha, this is going to produce an antidepressant effect for you later. And so that's, in terms of managing symptoms, that's huge, because uh, here in Sweden, the healthcare system is quite a bit better than in the U.S., where I'm from, but, you know, you you may end up with like two days in a psych hospital if you're depressed, or your therapist may just throw drugs at you and not necessarily keep track of what's happening uh, you know, across your, your scope of, of, of treatment. So it's really important to have tools to go, aha, the brain is changing in a reliable way. Here are several papers that are several findings that talk about it's reliable for assessing mood. Um, Richie Davidson, one of the big mood and EEG guys, is also a long-term meditator, showed that frontal asymmetry, having left to right activation reversed is a really reliable marker for major depression. Typically, we have a left front driver of the bus. When the right becomes more active than the left, you have a sort of avoid glass half empty negative kind of mindset. When the left is driving the bus, you have a approach, active, optimistic, glass half full kind of mindset. And so several papers, hundreds of papers have found that there's a, a soft reliability, if you will. Again, at the individual level, it doesn't track. At a population level, it's very valid. So here is an example of what comes out of a QEEG. This is a population assessment, so we're looking at standard deviations compared to a certain reference set. So standard deviations with the population mean are called z-scores. And in this case, there's two different populations. This is an NYU um, memory center study. Uh, 40, 27, 37, 40, 44 people. I can't do math, so uh, something like that. Walked into the NYU memory center with complaints of memory people who are mostly 65 to 75. And they said, look, I'm having memory issues. And this was a longitudinal study tracked for between seven and nine years per person. And they found they could pretty reliably sort those people who walked in with a memory complaint into two groups, those who would decline into dementia and those who would, would not. And what that shows is the group that did not decline had pretty typical levels of brain waves. And those that did decline, as you can see, had high levels of theta and low levels of beta. So again, a high theta-beta ratio. That's the same marker we use in kids and adults for ADHD, but in elders who have a memory problem, it predicts progression into more memory problems. Again, not suggesting that ADHD leads to dementia, but suggesting if you want to sort elders into those who will progress and those who won't, the theta-beta ratio is a pretty valid marker. Um, these are called ERPs. These are evoked potentials, a little blip in your brain that happens when you experience something. Uh, 
it's not terribly clear, but I have several populations of people superimposed. In the horizontal slide here, as you go up in age, it goes down in amplitude. So you have fewer cells firing. It's a really robust, effective age. On the right-hand side, we see the latency, the timing. As you go up in age, the timing of the peak goes from dead center on this line to about a 50 milliseconds later in time. So literally, your reaction times slow down as you become older and lose cell bodies. Here's a QEG showing different types of ADHD. You can actually screen and say, oh, you're ADD or you're ADHD pretty reliably. Extra theta is ADHD, extra alpha is ADD. Again, very reliable metrics. And several studies have shown you can sort this stuff into non-affected and affected populations purely on the data, not using behavior tests, not using interviews, simply looking at brain activity. You can say, oh, you have some issues executive function-wise, or you don't. Why do we look at executive function? Uh, essentially, from your perspective, it's a no-brainer, no pun intended, but you know why you want more executive function. You're, you, most of you guys are trying to really operate at your peak level. So executive function, to a large extent, is a proxy for other resources in the brain. There's no executive function region of the brain. You have areas involved with supervisory attention, with planning and execution, with sensory integration, all kinds of things coming together. So high-level executive function is a very robust and complex phenomena, and therefore anything that undermines the resources shows a drop-off in those resources. And attention, if you will, is the place that most people are aware of where their resources are quite soft when they are soft, attention and anxiety especially. So we often focus on this as a really tractable thing to both identify and go after for you. Here's another QEG. Um, brain waves on the top show that this person made a lot of delta and theta, so they're pretty sleep-deprived, maybe ADHD, maybe injured. Extra delta is an injury, usually. Uh, this person also has a little hot spot of beta on the front midline. That's an OCD marker. And the back of their brain was not relaxing, staying lit up in high beta. That's a hypervigilance kind of anxiety marker. Here's somebody else. Uh, this guy had a mixed presentation, so extra theta is ADHD, ADD, OCD again. He also had major depression with left front alpha and right front beta, which is not what you want. That's the same guy in the bottom after doing about 30 sessions of neurofeedback. This is one of my clients. And when I met him, he was the most impulsive guy I've ever met, and he was also really nasty. He would slide a cutting comment in before you finish your sentence every single time. He was brilliant, but kind of an asshole. And no one liked him. And he couldn't keep friends, he couldn't keep a job, he was also abusing substances, he was pretty miserable. At the bottom, he still felt a little bit ADHD, but you couldn't see it anymore. It didn't get in the way of his social and academic and employment sort of resources. And no more OCD, no more depression, those complete sort of symptoms lifted 100% and remained stable. I saw his mom, this guy was 28, by the way, I saw his mom about a year ago, and... Uh, he maintained all the gains, was back working again. It was working at a cannabis shop, so his mom wasn't happy, but you know. I can only do one thing at a time. Um, here's somebody else. Uh, this guy on the top was somebody who came in to see me because he wasn't sleeping. And he wasn't sleeping because he was drinking a lot or had drank a lot. He, he was doing a bottle and a half of wine, an Ativan, and an Ambien every single night for about 25 years. And when I met him, you know, he's a six foot five, 300 pound, bright orange gentleman from liver failure. And he was an unusual alcoholic in that he didn't crave alcohol, didn't want it, was trying to minimize his use of it, but he could not fall asleep without it. After years of drinking, the brain no longer knew how to produce GABA because the alcohol did it for the brain. In the absence of alcohol, the brain just did not downregulate. So you see these high beta and beta events when you have a lot of over-arousal. This is somebody who's like a nervous, shaky alcoholic who's burnt out, interrupts themselves, can't fall asleep, really scattered. Uh, and by the way, the top slide, the top uh, assessment was taken the day he came out of a 45-day medical detox for alcohol. He was completely sober and had been for a month and a half in the first map. This is not an effect of the alcohol actively. It's an effect of the damage, if you will, from the alcohol chronically. So the bottom set of pictures is him after doing three months of training with us. But about two weeks in, he would come in and lie down on the couch in the office and go to sleep just to prove he could. So, and I saw him about a year after this, and it was all stable, and, and he maintained the gains as well. So what is neurofeedback? Essentially, we're measuring these patterns moment to moment. And whenever they happen to shift in the right direction, we applaud the brain. 
with audio and visual feedback. So you should think Skinner's pigeons, not Pavlov's dog. We aren't doing weird things and making you have weird behaviors. We're taking things that already exist and shaping them up or shaping them down and seeing if it affects your resources. So it's training EEG, brainwaves, or HEG, hemoencephalography, blood flow, which you do for migraines, for executive function, for social function. Unlike body-based biofeedback, HRV, GSR, neurofeedback is almost entirely involuntary. You can't feel the little resources that are being rewarded. So you sit there and watch a computer screen, and the, the game, let's say, runs a little bit better when your brain does the right thing, runs a bit worse when your brain does the wrong thing. And over time, that teaches your brain to change its regulatory uh, domains. Um, I think we'll have time for questions right at the end, so if you could hold that for a second. Uh, neurofeedback almost never zaps the brain. You can do microstimulation. There's, there are roles for it, but the vast majority of neurofeedback does not do that, and it's not necessary to do anything active to zap the brain. Most people tend to have a three-month course of training and get permanent effects with about 30 sessions or more. I do 40 in three months, typically for my clients, three times a week, and that's enough to training to knock away ADHD, anxiety, sleep issues for almost everyone, and to make a really big dent in bigger things like seizures, depression, et cetera. And again, I'm using diagnostic language just because we know what these things mean. We know what the word depression, anxiety, ADHD mean. I'm not concerned about getting the diagnosis to go away. I'm concerned about meeting your needs. So unlike everyone else in the field, uh, Peak Brain approaches this work like it's a fitness center, not like it's a doctor's office or a psychological you know, perspective. So we're never going to ask you what you, we're, we're always going to ask you what you need, never going to tell you what you, sorry. We're always going to ask you what you want, never tell you what you need. That's what I meant to say. Um, we've already talked about this. The brain's very plastic and tends to rewire. Um, here are the domains in which there is very good evidence for neurofeedback, and I've given you a link to the comprehensive uh, bibliography that essentially categorizes thousands of papers by complaint and gives you all the different research. What you'll find if you follow this link is there are thousands of papers that have small ends, that have weak controls, and so the field has been left really in the couple decades behind in the research in terms of what we can do in the clinics. There's many reasons for that. One is it takes many months to make change. Two, it's hard to blind EEG. And three, nobody owns neurofeedback. So who's going to pay the three to five million dollar study costs if you can't get that money back. So the clinical efficacy far outstrips what you'll see in the research. Here's an example of a neurofeedback screen. Anyone who's coming on Monday will see this in action and practice with it. But essentially, we're pulling raw brain waves into the white squiggle, the white trace in the screen, and then filtering out frequencies you may want to measure. This person had three wires on their head, two ear clips and one wire right here. And then we're measuring different brainwaves moment to moment in the bottom left. And whenever those brainwaves all happen to shift in the right direction, a game runs better. On this game, uh, we have a little spaceship flying through a tube. It's a very basic game. And sort of techno music, climbing in volume and brain's doing the right thing and dropping in volume when it's not. And the spaceship stutters and it goes faster or slower based on what's happening in your brain. So um, I've got several studies, but not a lot of time. So I'm just going to show you there is some research. And you can dig into this yourself if you're interested. Many studies in ADHD, I mean, many studies in ADHD. Many, many studies in seizure disorder. I gave you the Sturman link, which is a metadata paper. You can pursue that. Huge number of studies on addiction. In general, the research shows the recidivism rate for alcohol relapse, which is about two-thirds to three-quarters, depending on where you look, gets completely reversed after neurofeedback. So it drops to one-third or one-quarter, depending on which study you look at. So it's a very robust effect. This is mostly using something called alpha-theta training, which as peak performers, you guys are going to want to know about. Alpha-theta training puts you in a hypnogogic state, halfway between awake and asleep, and it holds you there. So all that good idea you had when you fell asleep last night or the night before, when you solved world hunger or you know, cured cancer or had the best sci-fi novel plot idea, and then you fell asleep, and we were robbed of that beautiful creativity you had, we can hold you in that state, ideas, emotions, thoughts, insight bubbles up for you reliably. Depression, a lot of small studies again, but some really good studies that show one in five year stability on follow-up. Uh, OCD, 51% uh, efficacious is the standard for CBT therapy for those people that stay in CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy. 50, uh, over half of people drop out of CBT because it's painful to do, it's, it's stressful. For those who stay in it with OCD, it's the most effective treatment. Neurofeedback without exposing you to things has better efficacy than CBD. 
And then we actually get scores in intelligence. I'm sure you guys know who Dave Asprey is. Dave Asprey tends to tout this study, which is, you know, it's a study. It's pretty good. But honestly, intelligence is not a very robust phenomenon. Intelligence is what intelligence tests measure. So it's very circular. What you probably care about are things like inhibitory control, working memory, and other sub-resources underneath the complex thing called intelligence. We also have, again, more alpha-theta, really profound work on PTSD. I should mention that Peak Brain participates in a program called the Homecoming for Veterans, where we provide a free chair in all of our centers for a veteran for free training. So let us know if you're in the U.S., certainly, but we'll also be in Malmo. Uh, Peak Brain will be in Malmo in a couple of months. We're opening up, I think, in July or August. So if you're interested in Copenhagen or Malmo services, let me know, and we will uh, get you up and running down there. And here's several studies, again, in alpha-theta that show not only can you fix problems like alcoholism or PTSD, but really dramatic performance improvements in creativity. We tend to see permanent change in about 40 sessions. And I've also given you a link to a recent metadata study that shows at least six months of stability after neurofeedback with ADHD. And then if you want more information, some more resources, here you go. So thank you so much for listening. Uh, is there anything I can answer for you this time? Yes. Very impressive. Uh, on a uh, different topic, can TEG and neurofeedback um, stimulate delta waves in a later phase? In terms of getting better slow wave sleep? Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Um, if you don't make enough delta, we can boost it. If you make too much, we can reduce it. Either way, absolutely, yeah. Okay. Very easy to do. And you would bring it to an age level of just to get a... Uh, if you have a brain, it works. So, it, it, you know, <laughs> I work with four-year-olds up to people above 100. I'm, I'm also a gerontologist at UCLA, so I tend to do a lot of work with elders, 65 and up, but I also work with children quite effectively. And I have a lot of autism experience, so the other end of the age spectrum. So. Sir. Um, you mentioned um, 20 slides earlier. Uh, can you... Uh, Move it back. Sure. There was a very, very beautiful slide for me. Uh -huh. uh, there was a brain map, uh, a map of a brain connection. Maybe you measured uh, brain uh -huh. activity. Uh, what device do you use? Uh, to record? To, for, yeah, yeah. For, for this infograph. Yeah, um, there's several devices out there. Um, any 19-channel recorder can, can do it. Uh, we're using the Neurofield Q20 device, which is the cheapest on the planet right now for a good robust like a $5,000 amp. And that's the cheapest yeah. out there. But, uh, and as a, as a second question, can this approach reverse uh, cognitive um, disabilities and Alzheimer's? If you have Alzheimer's, you have too much tissue damage in the medial temporal lobe to, to receive benefits. I would direct somebody to the Recode or the, the Brzezedin program to do the 35 metabolic markers. Yeah. Brzezedin showed that if you have seven to nine of those markers out of range, you progress to dementia. If you correct them, people with like 15% of their hippocampus left completely regrow the hippocampus, symptoms go away, they go back to work. Okay, thank you. Low. The correlate, what's the correlation between brain maps and neurotransmitter levels? Very, very low. Here's the thing, guys. Neurotransmitter levels are almost meaningless as an absolute. Doesn't matter. There's no such thing as a chemical imbalance in your brain. It doesn't exist. That's a, a marketing strategy of drug companies. There's no validity to the chemical imbalance hypothesis of mental illness. It doesn't exist. So if you have a range of neurotransmitters, that's what you care about. If you stop ranging, illness and death happens. Parkinson's happens when you lose 75% of your dopamine neurons. No symptoms below that. It doesn't matter how, how much you have of these things. But it's a very coarse, indirect measure of dopamine and things. You see theta waves with low dopamine, but it's very coarse. So. Any final questions? Well, guys, thanks so much for listening. I really appreciate your time. Thank you, Timo. Thank you.